Hi guys, <clears throat> it is an unbelievably spectacularly gorgeous day here in the end times in paradise of the Mendocino County coast <clears throat> on this gorgeous but windy Sunday morning, September 18th, 2016. So Sunday morning is when your old doomsday preacher shares with you a reading from one of his favorite Bibles of the Apocalypse. And this week, I guess, in celebration of this dog and pony show as these two, as I guess the war mongerer versus the war criminal uh, in this dog and pony show to see which one of these people is going to lead us into World War III the quickest, I thought I would return to this excellent book by my Humpty Dumpty tribe hero Chris Hedges from six years ago, Death of the Liberal Class. And uh, many YouTubes, you can go on there and hear Chris talking about this book, but uh, I'm just going to sit here and read a few passages from the first couple of chapters uh, from this 210 book that is more relevant today than I think than it was then going in going into this damn election. So what is this book about? <clears throat> For decades the liberal class was a defense against the world the worst excesses of power, but the pillars of the liberal class, the former liberal class, the press, universities, labor movement, culture, Democratic Party, and liberal religious institutions have collapsed as effective counterweights to the corporate state. In its absence, the needs of the poor, the working class, and even the middle class, not to mention uh, the planet, no longer have a champion. The death of the, the liberal class has permitted the rise of a new and terrifying political configuration, and he's talking every bit as much about Hillary Clinton uh, in the Senate as he is, uh, <clears throat> uh, what's that guy's name, Mr. Trump. In his devastating new book, Chris Hedges chronicles the gradual corruption and death of the former liberal class, which no longer provides any institutional check to mitigate corporate control <clears throat> of politics, education, labor, the arts, religious institutions, and financial systems. Without any impediments, and in fact being cheered on by Hillary Clinton, <coughs> mm, yes, the corporate state is now dismantling the last vestiges of protection for ordinary citizens and of course the planet once put into place by the liberal class. Uh, <coughs> Although the liberal class was always compromised by its embrace of the power elite, it nevertheless provided a mechanism to make incremental reform possible. But with the rise of the corporate state, the liberal class has been forced to distort its own basic belief systems to support un fettered capitalism, the national security state, globalization, and staggering income inequalities. It relinquished its moral authority to, to become courier and apologist for a system of power that despises liberal values. And so we're just going to plow right into the first chapter. I was just going to stick totally to the first chapter titled Resistance, which I guess was, must have been some ironic uh, reference to, to the word resistance. Uh, I'm going to say, read a little bit out of this, but then we're going to jump to chapter two, Permanent War. 
anger and a sense of betrayal. These are what tens of millions of disenfranchised workers express. These emotions spring from the failure of the liberal class over the past three decades to protect the minimal interest of the working and middle class as corporations dismantled the democratic state, decimated the manufacturing sector, looted the U.S. Treasury, waged imperial wars that can neither be afforded nor won, and gutted the basic laws that protected the interest of ordinary citizens. Yet, the liberal class continues to speak in the prim and obsolete language of politics and issues. It refuses to defy the corporate assault. A virulent right wing, for this reason, captures and expresses the legitimate rage articulated by the disenfranchised. Can you say these clueless morons cheering on Donald Trump? And the liberal class has become obsolete even as it clings to its own positions of privilege within liberal institutions. Can you say Hillary Clinton? The anemic liberal class continues to assert, despite ample evidence to the contrary, that human freedom and equality can be achieved through the charade of electoral politics and constitutional reform. It refuses to acknowledge the corporate domination of traditional democratic channels for ensuring broad participatory power. Law has become perhaps the last idealistic refuge of the liberal class. Liberals while despairing of legislative bodies and the lack of genuine debate in political campaigns, retain a naive faith in law as an effective vehicle for reform. They retain this faith despite a manipulation of the legal system by corporate power that is as flagrant as the corporate manipulation of electoral politics and legislative deliberation. Laws passed by Congress, for example, deregulated the economy and turned it over to speculators. Laws permitted the pillaging of the U.S. Treasury on behalf of Wall Street. Laws have suspended vital civil liberties, including habeas corpus, and permit the president to authorize the assassination of U.S. citizens deemed complicit in terror. The Supreme Court overturning legal precedent ended the recount in the 2000 Florida presidential election and anointed George W. Bush as president. The inability of the liberal class to acknowledge that corporations have wrested power from the hands of citizens, that the Constitution and its guarantees of personal liberty have become irrelevant, and that the phrase consent of the governed is now meaningless, has left it speaking and acting in ways that no longer correspond to reality it has lent its voice to hollow acts of political theater in the pretense that democratic debate and choice continue to exist. The liberal class refuses to recognize the obvious because it does not want to lose its own comfortable and often well-paid perch. Um, Politicians, like generals, 
are loyal to the demands of the corporate state in power and retire to become millionaires as lobbyists or corporate managers, or in Bill Clinton's case, speech makers to clueless morons. Um, the media, the church, the university, the Democratic Party, the arts, and labor unions, the pillars of the former liberal class have been bought off with corporate money and promises of scraps tossed to them by the narrow circles of power. Journalists who prize access to the powerful more than they prize truth report lies and propaganda to propel us into a war in Iraq and, and everywhere else on the planet. Many of these same journalists assured us it was prudent to entrust our life savings to a financial system run by speculators and thieves. Those life savings were gutted. The media catering to corporate advertisers and sponsors are the same renders at the same time renders invisible entire sections of the population whose misery, poverty, and grievances should be the principal focus of journalism. And then he says all the same about the churches uh, looking like every other a uh, little, little pissant former liberal. A a anyway, guys, I think you get Chris's drift, but considering uh, the election uh, going on, this dog and pony show, as I say, between two warmongering criminals, uh, I think his chapter on permanent war is the most uh, relevant to 2016, so I'm going to uh, spend the rest of this sermon reading from Chapter 2, Permanent War, which he opens up with this great quote by Reinald Niebuhr from Beyond Tragedy. One of the most pathetic aspects of human history is that every civilization expresses itself most pretentiously, compounds its values most convincingly, and claims immortality for its finite existence at the very moment when the decay which leads to death has already begun. And what he's pointing out here is how Chris Hedges and Ronald Wright and Jer Jared Diamond and uh, oh, I'm, who's that, that other, anyway, anyone looking at the decline and fall of, of civilizations in the past one of the major ingredients is how more and more and more of their resources, their money, their manpower are put into creating permanent war, and which is one of the clearest signs of the imminent collapse and fall of, of any civilization. That's what that quote is referring to. Okay, so no surprise. Since the end of World War I, the United States has devoted staggering resources and money to battling real and imagined enemies. It turned the engines of the state over to a massive war and security apparatus. These battles, which have created an Orwellian state illusion of permanent war, neutered all opposition to corporate power and the tepid reforms of the liberal class. The liberal class 
fearful of being branded as soft or unpatriotic in the Cold War, willingly joined the state's campaign to crush popular and radical movements in the name of national security. Permanent war is the most effective mechanism used by the power elite to stifle reform and muzzle dissent. A state of war demands greater secrecy, constant vigilance and suspicion. It generates distrust and fear, especially in culture and art, often reducing it to silence or national can't. It degrades and corrupts education and the media. It wrecks the economy. It nullifies public opinion. And it forces liberal institutions to sacrifice their beliefs for a holy crusade, a kind of surrogate religion, whether it is against the Huns, the Bolshevik, the fascist, the communist, or the Islamic terrorist. The liberal class in a state of permanent war is rendered impotent. The collapse of liberalism, whether in Imperial Russia, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Weimar, U Germany, the former Yugoslavia, or the United States was intimately tied to the rise of a culture of permanent war. Within such a culture, exploitation and violence, even against citizens, are justified to protect the nation. The chant for war comes in a variety of slogans, language, and ideologies. It can manifest itself in fascist salutes, communist show trials, campaigns of ethnic cleansing, or Christian crusades. It is all the same. It is a crude, terrifying state repression by the power elite and the mediocrities in the liberal class who serve them, all in the name of national security. I, I don't need my bullshit detector button talking about national security. Permanent war which reduces all to speaking in the simplified language of nationalism is a disease. It strips citizens of rights. It reduces all communication to patriotic cant. It empowers those who profit from the state in the name of war, and it corrodes and diminishes democratic debate and institutions. The corporations that profit from permanent war need us to be afraid. Fear stops us from objecting to government spending on a bloated military. Fear means we will not ask unpleasant questions of those in power. Fear permits the government to operate in secret. Fear means we are willing to give up our rights and liberties for promises of security. The imposition of fear ensures that the corporations that wrecked this country cannot be challenged. Fear keeps us pinned in like livestock. Dick Cheney and George W. Bush may be palpably evil while Obama is merely weak. This might be the one place I hit my bullshit detector button. But to those who seek to keep us in a state of permanent war, whether Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, such distinctions do not matter. They meaning the, the military-industrial complex corporate state, get what they want. The liberal class, like Dost 
Dostoevsky's underground man can no longer influence a society in a state of permanent war and retreats into its sheltered enclaves where its members can continue to worship themselves. They decry the social chaos for which they bear responsibility but do nothing. They nurse an internal bitterness and mounting distaste for the wider society and because of their self-righteousness, elitism, and hypocrisy, they are despised. There is no national institution left that can accurately be described as democratic. Citizens, rather than authentically participating in power, are in power, have only virtual opinions in what Charlotte White calls participatory fascism. Citizens are reduced to expressing themselves on issues that are meaningless, voting on American Idol or in polls conducted by the power elite. The citizens of Rome, stripped of political power, are allowed to vote to spare or kill a gladiator in the arena, a similar form of hollow public choice. Hollywood, the news industry, and television, all corporate-controlled, have become instruments of inverted totalitarianism, as I illustrated in my book, Empire of Illusion. I think I've done a doomsday sermon on that book. They saturate the airwaves with manufactured controversy, whether it is the Tiger Woods sex scandal or the dispute between NBC late night talk show hosts uh, over extramarital affairs of John Edwards or whoever it is today. We confuse knowledge with our potted responses to these non-events and the draconian internal control employed by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, the military, and the police coupled with the censorship, witting or unwitting, practiced by the corporate media does for inverted totalitarianism what thugs and bonfires of prohibited books did in previous totalitarian regimes. And yet, the civic, patriotic, and political language we use to describe ourselves remains unchanged. We pay fealty to the same national symbols and iconography. We find our collective identity in the same national myths. We continue to deify the Founding Fathers, but the America we now celebrate is an illusion. It does not exist. Yes, and good God, guys, he goes on and on with this. Uh, has this long, excellent interview with good old Noam Chomsky. Wish I had time. But anyway, uh, speaking of time, I don't know where I am, so let me uh, jump to the end of permanent war. Yeah, jump to the end of permanent... <laughs> yeah, let's, let's all jump to the end of permanent war, guys. <clears throat> okay, winding up his, his rant on permanent war. Chronicles of war that eschew images and scenes of combat begin to capture war's reality. War's effects are what the state and the media, the handmaidens of the war makers, work hard to keep hidden. 
if we really saw war, what war does to young minds and bodies, it would be impossible to embrace the myth of war. If we had to stand over the mangled corpses of schoolchildren killed in Afghanistan and listen to the wails of their parents, we would not be able to repeat the cliches we use to justify war. This is why war is carefully sanitized. This is why we are given war's perverse and dark thrill, but are spared from seeing war's consequences. The mythic visions of war keep it heroic and entertaining, and the media are as guilty as Hollywood. During the start of the Iraq War, television reports gave us visceral thrill of force, yet hit us from the effects of bullets, tank rounds, iron fragmentation bombs, and artillery rounds. We tasted a bit of war's exhilaration, but were protected from seeing what war actually does to human bodies. The wounded, the crippled, and the dead are, in this great charade, swiftly carted off stage. They are war's refuse. We do not see them. We do not hear them. They are doomed like wandering spirits to float around the edges of our consciousness, ignored, even reviled. The message they tell us is too painful for us to hear. We prefer to celebrate ourselves and our nation by imbibing the myths of glory, honor, patriotism, and heroism, words that in combat become empty and meaningless, and those whom fate has to decreed must face war's effects, often turn and flee. The disparity between what we're told or what we believe about war and war itself is so vast that those who come back from war are often rendered speechless. What do you say to those who advocate war as an instrument to liberate the women of Afghanistan or bring democracy to Iraq? How do you tell them what war is like? How do you explain that the very proposition of war as an instrument of virtue is absurd. How do you cope with memories of small, terrified children bleeding to death with bits of iron fragments peppered throughout their small bodies? How do you speak of war without tears? Look beyond the nationalist cant used to justify war. Look beyond the seduction of the weapons and the pornography of violence. Look beyond Obama's ridiculous rhetoric about finishing the job of fighting terrorism. Uh, focus on the evil of war. War begins by calling for the annihilation of the other, but ends ultimately in self-annihilation. It corrupts souls and mutilates bodies. It destroys homes and villages and murders children on their way to school. It grinds into the dirt all that is tender and beautiful and sacred. It empowers human deformities, warlords, Shiite death squads, Sunni insurgents, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, 
and our own killers who can speak only in the despicable language of force. War is a scourge. War is a plague. It is industrial murder. And before you support war, especially the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, look into the hollow eyes of the men, women, and children who know it. Amen. Brother Chris, Chris Hedges, as you can see, one of my all-time Humpty Dumpty tribe heroes, despite the his little blind spot uh, of, of bringing four children onto this planet. But that's another rant. I'm going to wrap up this sermon, and you can go back to the dog and pony show uh, of the uh, the race to the bottom between the, the, these two evil war criminals, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, the frying pan of the fire. Hello, World War III. Bye, guys.